Did you know that the U.S. bank posted $37 billion, $600 million in the third quarter profits? And yes, that's a billion with the letter B. Now, take a look at this uh, article. And seriously, I'm not joking, okay? So take a look. It's from Investors.com, and it says banks' earnings rise at the highest level in six years. And they say that the report showed that the bank profits are on a rise as revenue growth picks up. And here's another article from uh, Los Angeles Times, and it says that the U.S. banks post a $37.6 billion in third quarter profits. Earnings rose 6.6% 6 .6 from a year earlier, and the industry's 13th straight quarter of a year over year gains and it's strange because when several years ago the United States of America faced one of the biggest economic crises since the Great Depression while some economists went as far to call it depression 2.0 and why did they call it depression 2.0 well here's this article where they says 2008 foreclosure filing set records and during that time we faced record foreclosures that spread like wildfire all across the United States and homeowners lost an average of hundred and twenty thousand dollars in equity from all-time highs of 2006 and that's from dqnews.com so hundred and twenty thousand is not chump change okay and while that was going on what was happening on Wall Street because Main Street was clearly hurting real bad but what was really going on with Wall Street well same thing with Wall Street right and you might remember how Main Street faced the foreclosures and some homeowners saw their equity and even their entire equity disappear Wall Street saw stocks fall to record lows from record highs and trillions were lost in paper assets as well and it's even to a point where even Time Magazine came out with a cover that called it the New Hard Times, right? But something interesting really, really happened on September 24, 2008. And if you remember this, try to take yourself back on exactly what you were do do doing during that time. Because this gentleman right here came on national televised and TV and he said, calm down, folks. The people of the United States, I'm here to protect you, and we can go ahead and save this economy, right? And that's actually President Bush himself. And what he did afterwards that has actually changed everything, and it goes back to how the banks made $3.6 billion. So what was that? Well, President Bush signed a historic $700 billion plan saying that stemming the credit crisis and to save the U.S. economy, right? Now, do you remember that? And the odd thing is this, is that was it really to save the economy or was it to save the special ones or the folks that they had kind of a special handshake? And a little bit of that I'll explain, but do you remember some of these companies, right? Like National City, Washington Mutual, Lehman Brothers, Goldman Sachs, right? Bear Stearns, Wachovia, Countrywide, AIG, IndyMac, right? These companies, some of them have been around for over 100 years, but they're gone. Poof, they're gone. Right. But how did these near bankrupt banks profit three points or better yet, thirty seven point six billion dollars? Well, I'll keep watching and I'll explain exactly what happened. And more importantly, this video is about how you can actually beat the banks at their own game and actually profit from it and how you can actually learn from that $37.6 billion profits that the bank made. And you can do that by growing your savings, retirement, and your passive income. And is it really that easy to actually mimic what the banks did? And is it really even a secret? Well, it might be. And I'm sure you agree that what you know is what you know. And what you don't know, well, quite frankly, you probably don't know. And that right there is what I call the secret, because what you don't know can be considered secret, right? So more importantly, again, this video is about how you can beat the banks at their own dirty little game and profit from it. So keep watching, and I'm going to explain in details how you can actually learn from this. But let me introduce you to someone. This guy is Isaac the Investor. 
Now, Isaac the investor, when he's investing, he has several options, right? And the, some of the common options that they have is the investor can go ahead and take their money and put it in places like the stock market, right? Mutual fund, money market, bonds, or even the savings account, right? It all depends on what the actual risk tolerance level of this particular investor and what type of return that they're going to get. And it all depends, again, on the risk tolerance and the return can be even under 1%. But I'm just saying 1% or maybe even up to as high as 8% and depending on how risky that particular investment is and how much of a risk tolerance Isaac the investor has, it can go up even above that money, right? But in the last few years, right, Isaac the investor may have been sitting on a pile of cash, right? Some of them. Well, some Isaac the investors may have made a boatload of cash after that uh, crisis that we had in this country. And some Isaac the investor their cash may have even shrunk down. And some Isaac investors may not even have cash and they actually are in debt now, right? But why is that, right? And some investors are asking, right? Well, the old way of investing, Isaac the investor would place their money in the stocks, mutual fund, money market, bonds, and savings. But the problem is none of these actually really have any collateral, right? So if the money is gone for whatever reason or something happens with these accounts, poof, they can be technically all gone. And we'll get to that in a little bit on how you can actually change all that in the new way on being able to understand what Isaac the Investor can do. But before I tell you, have you ever heard of this wise old quote? And it comes from this guy. And it says, those who don't remember the past are condemned to repeat it. Again, those who don't remember the past are condemned to repeat it. So that's what this presentation is all about. We're going back in history, folks. And my name is Jeff Koga. And I grew up in the city of West Covina. And uh, I started investing back in 2004 where I bought my first property. And I actually flipped the first property and made a tremendous amount of money on it. And since then, I've actually created a company called Capital Redevelopment Group. And we are the premier real estate investment management group within Los Angeles, California, metropolitan area. And we are an established successful company. And Capital Redevelopment Group focuses on how to continue to capitalize on real estate opportunities that have potential of delivering superior risk adjusted returns. And here are a couple of projects that we have done the before and after. This is a multi-million dollar uh, property that we've done right in the hills. And here's another one. And I've written several publications such as this and this and this and this. And I actually even run an online internet TV show called Flippanese TV. And also I'm the co-host of one of the highest rated uh, shows on iTunes called Real Estate Strategy Lab, where we teach other real estate investors and real estate agents how to become a marketing lead generation juggernaut. But what I'm really, really proud about is uh, just recently I released a book called Flipping Houses to Wall Street that actually made it to number one on Amazon as one of the best seller. And we actually made it even right next to Dave Ramsey. So that was pretty cool. But now I'm telling you this story of the past. Why? Because we're going to go ahead and go deep into the past. And before I did, I wanted to go and share um, what I'm about, about and what our company is all about. Now, remember that question on how the U.S. Bank posted $37.6 billion in third quarter profits? I want you to remember something, okay? What were you doing at that time, okay? And if you were too young or didn't care or didn't even remember at all, you really need to pay attention even more in this particular video in this presentation. So how did the U.S. Bank post $37.6 billion in third quarter profits? Well, it all starts back in what I like to call the dot-com, the www.com boom or the dot-com boom where Wall Street was happy, right? They had a big smile on their face. Why were they so happy? Well, it all had to do with the actual NASDAQ and the stock market. As you can see, it skyrocketed from the early 90s and it exploded in the late 90s. And if you remember those times, you remember everyone that you knew were talking about the stock market and how they were making money at that time. But 
as I did some research, okay, and I'm one of those types of guys that like to just sit down and really, really research on what's happening. So I was researching like a little studious Asian kid, and it led me to some data that actually put fear in my heart and got me excited at the same time. And it led me to a man named William Jefferson Blythe III. And he was born on August 19, 1946, in Hope, Arkansas, that are all places, right? And the interesting part about this is this. Three months prior to his birth, William Jefferson's dad actually lost control of his car, and he was thrown out, and he landed in a draining ditch where he drowned. So he was in a car accident, which didn't kill him, but the actual, he drowned in a drain in a draining ditch, right? So who is this William Jefferson Blythe the third? And why is he the key to understanding what happened in that financial crisis and how the bank made $37.6 billion in third quarter profits? Well, let me go ahead and introduce you to William Jefferson Blythe the third. And you may know him as President Clinton. And he was actually born as William Jefferson Blythe the third, and he was four years old when his mother married Roger Clinton, and he actually ended up taking that gentleman's last name. Now, how the U.S. bank posted thirty-seven point six billion dollars in third quarter profits? Well. It's not of what Bill Clinton did with this particular person. And you might remember this guy with the Lewinsky scandal, right, during that time. So it has nothing to do with that. But the mid to late 90s at that time was called the Goldilocks economy, right? And why was that? Well, remember I showed you about the dot-com and how it exploded, right? Well, what people don't realize and what people don't understand and what people don't ask questions on is why did it explode so much, right? Um, what President Clinton is really known for is he said, hey, you know what? He balanced the budget, right? And But was it all his doing, right? And was that really his claim to fame, as they call it? Well, here's a particular article that was just recently released by Business Insiders, and it says the untold story of how Clinton's budget destroyed the American economy. And keep in mind, this is strictly an opinion of one individual, and I'm just relaying this information to you. And why and how did President Clinton balance the budget? Well, to understand why, you first need to understand the components of this acronym, GDP. Right, And GDP stands for Gross Domestic Product, or in layman terms, it means the growth of the economy, or that's one of the ways they will actually gauge the growth of the economy. And it goes by a formula of GDP equals C plus I plus G plus parentheses X minus N. And C is the private consumption spending, right? And I is the investment spending, and G is the government spending, and the X minus M is the export minus import, essentially what I like to call the trade surplus. So when you have the private consumption or what the actual economy is spending, what type of investments are being spent, and what the government is spending, when you combine all of that, right, minus the export and import, then that's what you have, the GDP. So the interesting part about that particular article from my research that I did was during his era, right, you saw the biggest federal deficit surplus that went on, right? And as you can see, it went up, then it came down during that time. And it was in actually, as you can see right on the screen during that time. And the government was in a surplus near the end of President Clinton's tenure. And if the government is in surplus, it means that the government is taking in more cash than it's spending, okay? Again, if the government is in surplus, it means that the government is taking in more cash than it's spending, which is the opposite of a stimulus, right? And the interesting thing about the article, it even went on to say the U.S. trade balance during that time and when he came in actually became in the negative. Right, And the U.S. trade deficit exploded during the late 90s, which means that the X minus M was also a huge drag on the GDP during his year. Right? So the trade deficit was subtracting from the GDP, and the government was sucking up more money from the private sector than it was pushing out. And there was only one sector of the economy left to compensate, and it was actually the private consumption. And the private consumption compensated for the drags 
from the government and trade in two ways. And this is the most important part that was interesting about the article. And it even said that the personal savings rate during his tenure and during his time of presidency actually went down. Right. You can see it right on the screen and household savings rate collapsed during Clinton's presidency. And the another interesting part is that household debt began to surge. And this has never occurred prior to him being in the presidency. And that's what this article was explaining. Now, it all had to do with the Fannie and Freddie boom during that time. And the Fannie and Freddie boom all had to do with when the government is running a surplus and it's no longer has to issue much debt. But the risk government bonds where the risk free government bonds are a crucial component of portfolios for all kinds of financial institutions and for mom and pop investors who like the safety of a regularly treasury payout. The yield on the 10-year bond was over 5% back in those days. Nothing to sneeze at for people planning for a retirement, right? But then the article went on and says, this created a bit of a crisis. And he started quoting certain people. And some of the people that he started quoting is a bond trader that went on and says, oh my gosh. They were all saying there wasn't going to be any paper, right? And Prior to those years, there was no regular Freddie or Fannie auction. The system wanted it, right? And they went on to even say everything changed while the government dramatically slowed down the issuance of treasuries. Fannie and Freddie picked up the baton and started selling debt like never before. So again, because of the surplus, the treasuries were not being created. So guess what happened? Freddie and Fannie started creating debt, right? And that's where the fear was. And that's when even brokers were calling up mom and pop and said there's no more T-bill auctions, right? Very strange. And total agency issuance of mortgage-backed securities spiked in 1998 and 1999. And from then on, they never looked back. So what is the GST issuance of mortgage-backed security? So as you can see, it started creeping up right here in 1995. And you can see it started going up. And that's the reason why. And one of the reasons why I'll explain a little bit on how the banks posted $37.6 billion in third quarter profits. And this is the key to understanding how this occurred. Okay. Now, remember this chart, right? Uh, with the NASDAQ skyrocketing, right? What you don't understand is when you look actually at the chart, there's something very, very interesting. During the 19, the late 90s, there was an actual dip, right? So it wasn't just a straight rocket ship that went up. There was an actual dip at that time. And that's where it gets even more interesting. And that's where the actual key of understanding what really happened on $37.6 billion that the banks made a profit. So who are these banksters, right? And what's so important about 1999? Well, these banks had some pool inside the government, so much so that President Clinton signed something that changed how banks operate. And keep in mind, pay attention to the guy on the left right here, okay? And we'll get into what that's all about. And that guy right there is the Fed Chairman Alan Greenspan himself, and we'll get to what he did in a little bit. And it all had to do with these three civil servants, right? Uh, Senator Phil Graham, uh, Representative Jim Leach, Representative Tom Jay out in Virginia. So what happened in 1999 that changed how the banks operate? Well, it had to do with this particular document. And it had to do with what we call the Financial Service Monetization Act of 1999. But the interesting part is during that Financial Service Monetization Act of 1999, in Section 101, something called the Glass-Steagall was repelled, right? And Glass-Steagall Act permits affiliation between securities and banking companies, and it repels Section 32 of the Banking Act of 1933 to permit officers and directors to serve in those capacities with banking and security firms. So it actually changed something that actually took place in 1933. And 1933 is a very important year to remember. Why? Because that's when the other depression was, right? So remember these three civil servants, right, that I just talked to you about? Well, there it is. It's the Graham Leach Bailey Act that I told you about, right?
And here's the actual definition of Wikipedia, and it says, also known as the Financial Service Monetization Act of 1999, it repelled the parts of the Glass-Steagall Act of 1933, removing barriers in the marketing among banking companies, security companies, and insurance companies that prohibit any one institution from acting as any combination of an investment bank, a commercial bank, and an insurance company. And with the passage of the ground leach Blighty Act, commercial banks, investment banks, and securities firms, and insurance companies were allowed to consolidate, and the legislation was signed into law by President Bill Clinton himself. And it goes on to even say this part, which is the most interesting part, and it's all in Wikipedia, so you can pull it up yourself. And it says, a year before the law was passed, Citicorp, a commercial bank holding company, merged with the insurance company, Travelers Group, in 1998 to form a conglomerate city group, a corporation combining banking, security, and insurance service under a house of brand that included Citibank, Smith Barney, Prime America, and Travelers. And because this merger was in violation of the Glass-Steagall Act and the Bank Holding Company Act of 1956, the Federal Reserve gave Citigroup a temporary waiver in September 1998. And less than a year later, the GLB was passed to legalize these types of mergers on a permanent basis. And the law also repelled the Glass-Steagall's conflict of interest prohibition against simultaneous service by any officer, director, employee of security firms as an officer, director, director, or employee of any member bank. And that right there was the game changer. And why? You need to pay attention on what's going on. And surprise, surprise, the government gives favors to the banksters, right? Hmm, interesting. So is it really any real surprise to how the U.S. banks posted a $37.6 billion in third quarter profits? Stay tuned because this rabbit hole gets really, really deep, right? And remember this guy on the left, right? Uh, the Fed chairman, Alan Greenspan, right? And remember this actual dip that occurred uh, during the dot-com boom, right? And I said that's the key of understanding how the banks made their $37.6 billion in profit, right? And during the dot-com boom and why people were so happy and Wall Street was so happy, right? And how the actual Dow and Nasdaq just exploded, right? Well, the dot-com did explode, okay? And if you remember... During that time when the dot-com exploded, companies like Pets.com, right, were making an obnoxious amount of money, okay? And they earned revenues of $619,000 and yet spent $11.8 million on advertising. Mint, how does that work? How do you stay in business? Well, someone held the bag, right? Someone got hurt, right? Because money is never lost. It's just transferred, right? So the dot-com bust was clearly going on because you have businesses that are not producing revenue and just spending money. Why? Because investors wanted to invest. So what happened? Well, as you can see, as it skyrocketed, it came crashing down very, very hard, right? And if you lived during that time, you remember what happened instantly, right? Your account disappeared. And the Wall Street guys that were happy were no longer happy anymore. And Isaac, the investor, what happened with most of the investors, right? They saw their retirement account dwindle, disappear, poof, gone. Why? Because it went up and it came skyrocketing. But by this time, this was 2001. And by that time, we needed a new presence. So there was campaigns going on, right? We had the Republicans, George W. Bush, and the Democrats, we had Al Gore at that time. And if you remember that controversy during that time, right, when what happened in Florida, right, and how we just barely, 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 barely won, and which was, what, George W. Bush himself, right, making this man the president. And on January 20th, 2001, President Bush took oath, and he said, to preserve, protect, the Constitution of the United States. And eight months into President Bush's first term, something tragic occurred. And if you remember, 
this date, it's September 11, 2001. But in 2002, Alan Greenspan, the federal chairman at that time, and the feds cut rate to all time lows. And Greenspan says, be risky, but mortgages, not treasuries. And Fair Ch Federal Chairman Greenspan advisors for Douche Bank and JP Morgan holds the position on council of the Foreign Relations and Group of 30. So he's a very powerful, powerful man. And he dropped the interest rate to historical lows, which is never done before. So what happened when they dropped the interest rate to historical lows? Well, in Alan Greenspan's mind, he wanted to actually have the economy avoid another recession, as they did in the dot-com bust, right? You saw that. So the Federal Reserve started pumping out money. And if you want to learn more about actually what happened with the credit crisis, right, you can watch this video here called The Crisis of Credit that will break down exactly what happened in details. And you'll be amazed on what happened. And I'm not going to go ahead and explain in this video, but it all had to do with the majority of the low interest rate and the high return that the investors were getting based on a lot of the help by these acronyms, CDO, CDS, and subprime, collateral debt obligation, cl uh, collateral debt swaps, right? Or credit default swaps, I'm sorry, and the subprime loans. And the psychology of the American people believed that the buying house was an investment. And how did that work? Well, as money came readily available, right, this money was given to the homeowner who actually bought the property and was making what? Mortgage payments back as returns, right? So as money were pumping in, more houses were being sold and the payments were coming back and it was kind of like a vicious cycle going back and forth. Uh, but the problem was this, is that as the market appreciated, these homeowners, some of them, no down payment, right? So if the market went coming down, there were no equity in the house, right? So what, what is the homeowner going to do or what will the homeowner do if there's some type of a loss of job, right? Or they're hurt on a job, right? Hmm. They might just let the house go. Who knows? But as I said, the market still appreciated. Why? Because of it was so cheap to borrow money. So the credit default swap, the collateral debt obligation, the subprime mortgages all fueled the market appreciation. But then suddenly it stopped. It came all crashing down. And remember this article I showed you earlier, right? And why did they call it the Depression 2.0, right? It was because of this, right? Record foreclosures that spread all across the United States. And remember this article I showed you about on how the homeowners lost an average of $120,000 in equity from all-time highs in 2006, right? And why I said that all explains how the banks are profiting $37.6 billion. And yes, that's billion with a B. And how are they doing it? It all has to do with something called money arbitrage. And some people will call it private money lending. And I'll show you how you can actually do what the banks do and actually use the dirty little secrets to be able to go ahead and regain some of the losses that you have actually had in the past. And remember this, $37.6 billion, right? And it all has to do with arbitrage. But what is arbitrage? Well, here's what Wikipedia has to say. In economics and finance, arbitrage is the practice of taking advantage of a price difference between two or more markets. So again, the practice of taking advantage of price difference between two or more markets. And this is the actual key. And this is the key of understanding how to use the same tactics that the banks have been using for your advantage. And remember this article about how President Bush signed the historic $700 billion plan to stem the credit crisis and save the U.S. economy, right? Right? Well, here's how it worked. Well, the Federal Reserve gave a loan, a huge loan, right, to the big banks. Now, the big banks, what do they do? Well, they gave the money to what? The homeowners, right? Pretty simple enough, right? But in arbitrage, right, I said the practice of taking advantage of price difference between two or more markets. Now I'm going to explain to you how the banks were doing arbitrage. 
Well, the Federal Reserve lent out the money, right? And again, lent it out to the banks. And again, the banks then lent it out to the homeowners. But in arbitrage, it's the price difference in two different markets. So what were those markets? Well, the first market is the actual rate at which the Federal Reserve was renting or actually giving a line to the banks. And then from there, the second market was how the banks were lending money to the homeowner, right? Remember, right, the arbitrage, two different markets, right? But again, as I said, more importantly, this video is about how you can beat the banks at their own game and profit from it, right? So again, remember Isaac the investor, right, who may put his money in his savings account or something like that, right? And, and when he does that, what does he do? He'll go and take his money to his savings, but what does the bank actually do when he actually puts the money into the savings account, right? And the arbitrage of the two different markets. Well, instead of the reserve giving the money as a line, if you put in the savings account, that'll just change that picture to your piggy bank. But still, when you do that, you still have these two green areas. Those are the two different marketplaces where banks are making profit. Now, how the heck does that work? Well, let me break this down to you. Isaac, the investor, will go ahead and deposit the money to the bank. And in exchange for depositing money to the bank, the bank may give interest rate back to Isaac, the investor, depending on what type of account. It can be a money market, savings, CDs, right? Uh, anything like that. And I just have 1% as a prime example. Some can be way less than 1%, especially with the interest rates are being low as it is now, right? But what does the bank do, right, after you deposit it and they give 1% or less than 1% uh, back to you as interest? Well, the bank's going to go ahead and lend it out to homeowners, right, or other loans so that way they can go ahead and make a profit, right? But at what rate? Well, it all depends, right, on the credit score worthiness, right, the market, right, and the prime rate as they call it sometimes, right? But the percentage will range, but it will be much higher than 1%. So, for example, if it's 8%, right, that delta difference from the 8 to 1 is 7% gross percentage return that you can get. So it's a hefty profit that they can make from money that's not even theirs, right? And I'm not even including the leverage component that the banks have. So again, if the two markets are from what the banks are borrowing the money or getting the money from deposits and what they're actually lending it out to to the customer, right? Let me ask you this, okay? But what if, right? Isaac, the investor, and again, I'm going to ask this what if again, is because this is where it gets very interesting and in how you're going to learn how to use that exact same strategy of the arbitrage, the green arrows here, how the banks are borrowing money and it can be your money or from the feds and then lending it out to someone else, a customer or a client at a much higher interest rate and making the amount uh, difference from the amount that they're taking in the cash at the interest rate and what they're lending it for, right? That's their profit. And I'm going to show you how to actually capitalize on this. But what if Isaac, the investor, right, lent the money directly to the homeowners instead of actually putting it into the bank and then the bank lending it out directly to the homeowners, right? How would that work? What type of return would Isaac the investor get? Hmm, something to think about. But how you can capitalize on it is you don't wanna to lend to anyone, right? You wanna to lend to a specific buyer. And here's some of our projects that we've done. Buyers that, you know, do these types of projects. And if you want, you can go to that uh, website on the screen for more information. And here's an actual before picture of a property, right, that we've actually bought. And you can see it's pretty ugly, right? Look at this, right? Purple, orange, blue sky cabinets, right? Really ugly stuff. But it's what we did afterwards that makes it very, very interesting. So as you can see, there's a demo already going on here in the back. There's a shed, right? Look at that demo, 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 and uh, ugly, ugly stuff. And here's the actual after, right? So as you can see, the front looks dramatically different than it was before, right? Look at that nice little red curve appeal, uh, a door that gives it the nice little curve appeal, right? The front and the inside, and as you can see, it's a wide open inside, right? The kitchen's wide open, beautiful black trim, right? And look at these, uh, look at the kitchen, right? Beautiful cabinets, right? And uh, the tiles and these faucets that we have, right? Pretty awesome. And you can see we did a heck of a job on this particular property. And you can see 
the little back part looks dramatically different than what it was before. Why is that? Well, it all had to do with adding a square foot on this property. Now, what I really love about this is look at this front. We have actual steel in the front, right? Who does that to their house? Well, you know, we do. It looks very nice. But the interesting part is this, is that uh, we actually bought this property for 273000 and we resold it for $500,000. And as you can see, we did an addition of 500 square feet and we flipped out in six months. And the very, very interesting part is this, is that uh, here's a tip. When we're doing additions, you need to get at least a three to one on your money in terms of construction, meaning if the construction is $100 to $150 per square feet, your ARV flip out price per square feet should be at least 300 to 500 square feet. Now, why is that important to Isaac the investor, right? And the type of return that they can get? Well, because Isaac the investor at this moment, some Isaac the investors are lending money to what we call investor operators, such as ourselves. And it all asks, what is that return, right? So again, Isaac the investor is actually already lending to a lot of investor operators. It can be like ourselves or other investors, and they're getting a significant return. And that return, is much higher than what you would get at the bank and just putting it into a CDs or even putting it into uh, actual uh, money market account, right? And the big thing is the collateral, right? You just saw the pictures of the before and after of a property. That's the actual collateral. So if you're Isaac the investor and you're putting money in the stock market, mutual fund, what collateral do you have? And what? Security do you have? Hmm, something to think about. So what is that return? And what can you possibly get? Well, for more information, go to www.capitalredevelopmentgroup.com and make sure to download our free report on how you can take advantage of private money lending and use the same tactics the banks have been using to us for decades and how you can capitalize on today's real estate market. So this is Jeff Koga with Capital Redevelopment Group, and I'll see you on our next video. Bye-bye.